Howdy. Welcome to another episode of Think Theism, the apologetics and theology podcast at Texas A&M. I am Zachary Lawson. I'm joined by co-host and irreducibly complex man, Andrew Robbins. Hi there. You'll notice that our sound sounds wonderful today. This is because we are being graciously hosted by Red Sea Catholic Radio. Go to redsearadio.org to show your appreciation. And our guest today probably needs no introduction. He's the author of Darwin's Black Box and widely considered to be the father of the intelligent design movement, Dr. Michael Behe. How are you doing, Dr. Behe? Great. It's, it's wonderful to be with you folks. All right. So you are in Aggieland for the Veritas Forum, which will be later today. Um, is this your first time in College Station? Well, uh, it's the first time in a while. I was here, oh, maybe two decades ago, but uh, mm-hmm. I, I hear things have changed since. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just a tad. Um, so the topic for tonight is God and or evolution. Now, that title I pick because it's clickbait, but um, what's going to be sort of your general position uh, during the conversation tonight? Well, my position is going to be uh, that much of biology, and particularly at the molecular level, shows signs of having been purposely intelligently designed. Mm-hmm. That is, it did not, uh, Darwinian mechanisms, evolutionary mechanisms are not sufficient to explain it. Okay. And you jumped on the scene um, almost 25 years ago now, in 1996, with this book right here, Darwin's Black Box. Um, started a bit of a firestorm, to say the least. <laughs> Just a bit. Just a bit. <laughs> and then that was followed up with another book, The Edge of Evolution. And now you have a new book, uh, Darwin Devolves, um, which was released, I believe, last year. So what has been sort of the, the, the broad overview of these three books? So Darwin's Black Box was the irreducible complexity book. That's, right. that's what I remember it as. Right. Um, so what's kind of been the general move with these three books? And then where does uh, Darwin Duvall's fit in your overall uh, project? Well, uh, I started out with uh, Darwin's Black Box, which gives people a tour of what biochemistry has found in the cell. The black box of the title is supposed to be the cell because it, it's, um, un- it was unknown to Charles Darwin and his contemporaries. They didn't know what was contained in it. And I showed that, it contains all these complex machines, well, that science has discovered, mm-hmm. and that some of them are irreducibly complex. And that just means they need all their parts to work, and so they can't be put together gradually. So that's a big problem for Darwin. And I argue that a better uh, conclusion is that they were purposely, intelligently designed. Mm-hmm. So that would kicked it off. And then for the next two books, they pursued the question, well, if some things in life are purposely designed Mm -hmm. and not everything is, I mean, there's no reason to think that the shape of your nose is specifically designed, Mm -hmm. uh, then where is it reasonable to uh, draw a line between those two? I call that the edge of evolution. That was Mm -hmm. the title of the second book. And uh, I argued in the second book that well, it's it's at least reasonable to draw the edge of evolution at the uh, level of uh, class, mm-hmm. uh, and that in vertebrates is uh, fish and birds and uh, mammals and so on. In the latest book, I uh, I address the same question, but with newer science results, and mm-hmm. there's been a revolution in. Uh, the ability of, of science to sequence DNA. And uh, you have to do that to track down the mutations that natural selection can select because mutations are changes in molecules and mm-hmm. ultimately in DNA. And um, the, the uh, book title is Darwin Devolves, and that reflects the surprising fact that most of the beneficial mutations that natural selection selects that help the organism survive in a different environment are degradations or breaking of pre-existing genes. They're not the making of genes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I I argue that that's going to overwhelm any constructive process that Darwinian uh, mechanism might have. Mm -hmm. Uh, I appreciate right here at the very front of the book, 
uh, you have your key thesis statement. The first <laughs> rule of adaptive evolution is to break or blunt any functional gene whose loss would increase the number of a species offspring. Exactly. <laughs> and the reason for that is because it's easy to break stuff. Mm -hmm. And if uh, by breaking stuff, you can have some effect, which will uh, help an organism, then that'll be the first effect to come along. So it will be selected and it'll quickly pass through the species. Uh, just as an example, suppose there were a, a brown bunny rabbit and it start, the environment started to change and it started to snow more where it was and it would be helpful for the uh, rabbit to have white fur. Well, one thing, one mutation that would be expected to come along much more quickly than constructive one is uh, a break in genes that are responsible for making the pigmentation of the fur. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be selected. And that would help, but it would be a... Uh, degradation or breaking of a pre-existing uh, gene, not a construction of something new. Mm -hmm. And presumably then uh, biological complex complexity requires the acquisition of more complex and increasing as opposed to decreasing and uh, degradation. That That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, as I wrote in Darwin's Black Box, you've got these phenomenally complex machines mm -hmm. and they're not going to be built by a degradative process. Yeah, um, I, I was actually hoping, you know, you made the black, the bacterial flagellum like a household uh, icon of, of intelligent design. Uh, just to bring some of our listeners up to speed, could you kind of summarize why you think, uh, or at least why you did think at the time that the, bac the bacterial flagellum was um, or is like the poster child of intelligent design? Well, it's great because you can immediately see in the structure of the machine itself uh it's design. Mm -hmm. uh, for folks who uh, don't know about it, the flagellum is an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim, and it's got all sorts of mechanical parts. It's got a rotor and a propeller and a drive shaft and a hook joint or a universal joint and all sorts of stuff. And in an electron microscope, scientists can look and you can see these parts. And so, uh, with those images or drawings of them, uh, I use that as the uh, frontispiece for Darwin's Black Box because when you look at it, you, you immediately realize this was designed. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because you see all these parts that were put together for a purpose. So it, it, uh, it, <laughs> in a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> oh, for, for, for sure. Yeah. And there are plenty of pictures in, in uh, Darwin's Black Box um, to, to outline that. Um, but I, I think the, the key point there being that if you take away even one part of um, the flagellum, it, it's not like it's a slightly worse flagellum. It's, it's just not a flagellum anymore. That, that's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I termed irreducibly complex. And mm -hmm. complex and it's irreducible because you can't take anything away from it. And I use uh, an everyday analogy to explain that concept, uh, a mousetrap, a mechanical mousetrap you might buy at a hardware store. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs all of its parts to work. You take away the spring or uh, the little hammer that hits the mouse, or uh, and it's, it's not that it works half as well. It, it doesn't work at all. It's mm -hmm. broken. So yeah. you can imagine that's a big problem if you're looking for a way to put that together gradually because you don't get the function pretty much until it's complete. Mm -hmm. So that was about 25 years ago when you started um, bringing, or bringing to the attention this irreducible complexity, and a lot of people were very not happy with that. Um, so 25-ish years later, how, how does it hold up, do you think? How, uh, how much do you think um, you've changed your mind since Darwin's Black Box, and how much do you think has withstood the scrutiny? Well, in my completely unbiased opinion, <laughs> yeah. uh, it has all stood up. Not That's not to say there haven't been criticisms and people pointing to different things that they think uh, did, do not uh, comport with my arguments. But in my own humble opinion, I wouldn't change a word of Darwin's black box. And the only thing I would change is <clears throat> there are sections <clears throat> where I write... <clears throat> that I think Darwinian processes can make, you know, certain molecules like hemoglobin and so on. I have grown even less fond of Darwin's mechanisms. I, th I think mm -hmm. it can't do things that I, uh, that I, uh, f for purposes of argument, granted in mm -hmm. Darwin's black box. So if anything, Darwin's black box <laughs> may be a little too friendly for, for Darwinism nowadays. 
Um, that's right. But, it, you know, science advances quickly. So it's yeah, you sna- never, you always never. a snapshot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So the, the bacterial flagellum, uh, the blood clotting cascades, another example you've used. Um, I don't think we have time to go through all of them. But I'm just curious, are there any examples that um, you think uh, – are bad examples of intelligent design as in, not bad design, but like someone has said, ah, here's intelligent design, but they just went all wrong about it. Uh, there is one uh, in particular, and, and I actually differ with some folks who are colleagues of mine in the ID movement. Mm-hmm. And that is on a, a sub, something called junk DNA mm-hmm. in the past uh, decades. Uh, a lot of DNA has been discovered in, cells of advanced organisms, eukaryotic cells, uh, that doesn't code for proteins. Proteins are the machinery of cells. And people didn't know what it did. So some Darwinians said, well, it probably doesn't do anything. It just, you know, it, uh, it collects by random processes. Maybe when DNA is duplicating, a section kind of accidentally gets duplicated a couple times. And it it, it's junk. It, it, it just accumulates over time. And uh, some people friendly to IDs, uh, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. Um, later on, it was discovered, wait a second, you know, this piece here that we thought was junk, it turns out to have a function. And then a little bit later, wait, this went over too. This has a function. And, mm-hmm. and these days you get lots, lots of reports of function on what was thought to be junk DNA. It's never a good idea to bet against something having a function Mm -hmm. in biology. Well, after this started to happen, in in my view, some ID proponents kind of retrospectively said, well, hey, this is just what you would expect on Mm. an intelligent design view. And I disagree with that. I think uh, the ID view doesn't really say much of anything about junk DNA. Mm. I don't think Darwinian... Uh, The Darwinian theory says much about junk DNA. I I think it's kind of neutral. And you have people arguing back and forth for the same thing. So I I don't think that's a good idea. That's a bad design argument. (laughs) Okay. So so if someone says, ah, well, you know, we see that junk DNA uh, was at one time thought to be functionless, but now it does have function. Ah, this is exactly what you would expect on intelligent design. Yeah. Well, yeah. Then why didn't they say that before the <laughs> yeah. evidence came forward? Yeah, okay. these these yeah. retrospective predictions are mm-hmm. always suspect. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that that is kind of interesting. So one one thing I'm curious about, I know that in general, a biological principle is to use as minimal energy as possible. Um, so if there were junk DNA, it seems to me, again, not a biochemist, but it seems to me that you would expect that that would be trimmed out of the genome rather than being maintained with all the successive energy. Yeah, uh, you would, but there are kind of fine details where it depends on the population size and the odds of trimming good mm-hmm. stuff out with the bad. And so it's a little convoluted, but other things being equal, you're right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so... One other thing, too, um, following after Darwin's black box, uh, and that started a huge national conversation about intelligent design, uh, creationism, the role of God in the classroom. And I think that pretty much culminated in the uh, 2004 Kitzmiller versus Dover uh, trial in which you were a witness um, in in that. So uh, one of the elements that came out, one, one of the things the prosecution uh, mentioned, which I think whoever was against intelligent design, I don't remember who it was prosecution yeah, they, or defense, but yeah, they were the plaintiffs. The plaintiffs. plaintiffs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I, hard for me to keep track. Uh-huh. But one of the quotes they pulled up was from a uh, guy at the discovery Institute, friend of the show, Paul Nelson, who uh, we've actually interviewed before I asked about this quote too. Uh-huh. But one of the things that he said was um, quote, easily the biggest challenge facing the intelligent design community is to develop a full fledged theory of biological design. We don't have such a theory right now, and that's a real problem. Without such a theory, it's very hard to know where to direct your research focus. Right now, we've got a bag of powerful intuitions and a handful of notions, such as irreducible complexity, but as yet no general theory of biological design. Now, Paul said that 15 years later, that's probably not true. So I wanted to get your take on this. Uh, Did you think it was true in 2005, and um, do you think intelligent design is in a much better position now than it was whenever it was uh, litigated. 
Well, uh, let me first start off by saying Paul Nelson is a, a really great guy and very friendly. I've known him for 25 years, but I think he was wrong on this. Okay. That I don't think you need a general theory of intelligent design to make conclusions. Just like you don't need a general theory of Rembrandt or his mm-hmm. psychology to uh, know that work of his was painted, which was purposely made. The intuitions... I I think that would be a bad word to use. I think we we can strongly reach conclusions of design by looking at the objects that we suspect were designed. You look at Mount Rushmore as a classic example. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, nobody, even if they had never heard of it before, would uh, would think that that was an accidental arrangement of rocks. Uh, and uh, I'm not even sure. Uh, there can it depends on what you mean by an uh, a comprehensive theory of design. Of course, when you're talking about design, you're talking about an intelligent being that's mm-hmm. doing stuff. And even you know we uh, people are very hard to predict. So it would be uh, hard to get a general theory. Nonetheless, uh, as I have written, um, you can do a number of things. And one thing is try to delimit what requires design, what requires requires arrangement versus what could be uh, accomplished by just random changes in natural selection or whatever other evolutionary process that you want to invoke. And I think that we have made progress there, especially I think with the more recent uh, work in science where mutations are able to be tracked and uh, followed and we found out that, in fact, these mecha- this Darwinian mechanism is actually strongly devolutionary. So mm-hmm. uh, I think, I, I think, in spite of itself, the, and the scientific community is uh, is helping to set up a a, a more broad uh, theory of design. Um, so building off of that idea, uh, you know, you're. Some people say that if you critique the modern synthesis or neo-Darwinism or what have you, that you're probably just like an intelligent design person uh, trying to sneak God into into things. Um, But like you said, there have been, you know, real biologists, even atheistic biologists with no no design fight or dog in the fight at all Mm -hmm. that have been challenging some of the the limits of of. the modern synthesis, sometimes called neo-Darwinism. I understand there's a distinction between them, but I'm I'm not totally sure what the what it is. <laughs> They're used in and the the terms are used pretty much interchangeably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um so one of them is this book here, uh Evolution the Extended Synthesis. Uh this came out, I guess, about ten years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um and it's basically just a compendium of scientists writing articles saying there's some deficiency within the Darwinian scheme as it is, or I'll say the modern synthesis to be consistent here. Uh, there's some inconsistencies, there's some deficiencies, um, and specifically uh, the stated deficiencies being gene centrism, gradualism, and externalism. Now, I don't know what all those mean, but <laughs> gradualism is what you've definitely focused on uh, for, for sure. Um, and I was actually struck by this quote here. I cannot pronounce the gentleman's name. He's Italian, so uh, but it's uh, Massimo uh, Pigliucci. Uh, uh, Pigliucci, I believe is how it's pronounced. Uh-huh. Um, and he has this really fascinating quote right here, and I, I'd like to read it. He said, Underlying the shift toward a causal mechanistic approach in evolutionary theory is a hugely expanded knowledge base consisting of large data sets in genetics, development, plasticity, inheritance, and other empirical domains. While the modern synthesis, in the absence of such data, had to contend with black boxing all mechanistic aspects. And thus, the modern synthesis was unable to explain how organi- organism, oh my goodness, organismal change is realized at the phenotypic level. The organism, as an explan- explanandum, has returned through the extended accounts. Now, if I read that and did not know it was in this book, I could have very, gen- I could have thought that came from an intelligent design person. Yeah, that that's right. Uh, surprisingly. Uh Probably a, a good chunk of biologists are skeptical of Darwin's theory these days. I, mm. I'd guess a third of them. Uh, the more you get into evolutionary biology, the more skept- skeptical numbers you find. And that's because they're having trouble fitting what 
science has discovered in recent decades into Darwin's uh, theory. So there's a, a couple of comments one can make. Uh, first is that the public rarely hears of that. Mm -hmm. Whenever a challenge is raised to evolution, then all the wagons are circled and we, uh, the public is told that Darwin, everybody knows that Darwin solved, solved the problems now and forever. So please, uh, nothing to see here. Just go, mm -hmm. go back, uh, and, uh, go back to your homes. And that's not the case. I mean, that's simply not the case. Even professional biologists uh, who have no love at all for intelligent design think Darwin's theory is uh, in need of help. Uh, the second thing to say is that uh, the large data sets that Massimo Piliucci uh, is speaking of don't give any help to explaining mm -hmm. <laughs> how organisms could evolve. You ask, you know, what are these data sets telling you about, you know, I don't know, how birds got feathers? Well, I don't know. Uh, and how, how do they explain the bacterial flagella? Well, oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. There are proponents and they're pushing this idea. But right now, for, for my money, I think Darwinism explains more uh, stuff in biology than do the processes that extended evolutionary synthesis people mm -hmm. cite. So as I understand it, they accept all of Darwinism and then they're adding on additional things to that. Is, would that be correct or? Well, that, that kind of shifts depending on oh, it depends <laughs> the on who audience asking. and yeah. who's, who's speaking. Yeah. Some, some, uh, say, oh yeah, we don't want to, we just want to add a few little things to mm -hmm. it. Uh, but then behind closed doors, they'll say, you know, we have to throw this Darwinism out root and branch. Okay. Yeah. yeah it, it's interesting. You said that whenever these types of critiques come up, the public never knows about it. I mean, this book's almost 11 years old. I'd never heard yeah, of it. Uh -huh. seems like it would be, you know, headline news. Yeah. Um, and now to some extent that did happen with the, uh, I guess about four years ago with the Royal society meeting, um, uh, on this, was that kind of in the same vein as the extended synthesis people? I definitely recognize some names were overlapping. Yes. Uh huh. Um, yeah, the Royal Society, which is a scientific society in England, kind of comparable to our National Academy of Sciences. They, uh, they sponsor meetings, a bunch of meetings every year. And one of mm -hmm. them was on alternative approaches to evolution or some such title in which, yeah, folks who are advocates of these alternative approaches uh, such as niche, something called niche construction and, and symbi uh, symbiosis and uh, things that generally aren't talked about in neo-Darwinian circles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were the main uh, constituents of the uh, meeting attendees. And it got a lot of press ahead of time because people were saying, oh, oh, uh oh, what is, you know, is this, you know, is this some... Uh, strange uh, anti-scientific attitude seeping into the uh, the Royal Society, and and during the meeting, I did not attend, but I heard firsthand accounts. Uh, people spoke for the these other mechanisms, but everyone was at pains to uh, to say we're all getting along here. No, we're mm -hmm. not trying to overthrow Darwin, and and uh, um, so yeah, it, there's clearly a lot of social pressure around mm -hmm. this issue, not only in public, not only in say school, uh, school battles and school boards, but also in professional societies. Mm -hmm. So I, I think one question that would be helpful here for those of us that are outside the guild is, is this extended synthesis, and to what extent is it really like a competitor with intelligent design? Because one could basically say neo-Darwinism is falling apart, there are deficiencies, and you've got basically two schools of thought. You either have intelligent design or the extended synthesis. Um, so one question is, uh, to what extent are they competing? And then to uh, the second question, what, what if God designed these mechanisms, <laughs> you know, or, or the intelligent designer? Well, you might... Uh get different answers, but since you're asking me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think they don't compete at all. Okay. I think the extended synthesis does, you know, raise interesting questions and there are factors which 
affect organisms that people hadn't been paying attention to. Uh, one good one, one uh, interesting one is uh, something called niche construction. Mm -hmm. That is that uh, Darwinism says that organisms have to adapt to their surroundings, but a lot of organisms modify their surroundings. Yeah, and like beavers even. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And and uh, one that's been studied is, is termites. Termites build big mounds that, uh, that um, affect how, how well they survive and, and so on. That's interesting. But that doesn't tell you where termites came from in the first place mm -hmm. or, or uh, beavers or, or any such thing. So mm -hmm. uh, the ideas of the extended evolutionary synthesis, for the most part, are all fine and, and they're not out of, out of there and they certainly have a place in biology, but they are not going to answer the question of how com complex systems arose in life. Okay. Did you so... So my question is, what is the ultimate goal uh, of intelligent design in terms of interacting with um, the more traditional scientific community? Is the goal to have um, you know, agent causation as an acceptable explanation of scientifically observed um, you know, things in the scientific record? Um, is it to have God allowed as an explanation for things? Um, and then kind of on the other side of that, how do you respond to the criticism that, that it's just a God of the gaps argument? I think the goal is yes, to have agent causation be a legitimate, uh, explanation. That is to say that, well, where did the bacterial flagellum come from? Uh, and you'd say, I don't know who the agent is. I don't know what, uh, processes, uh, he, she, or it might have used, but, it was caused by an intelligent agent. Uh, and uh, I want that to be uh, kind of the dominant idea in evolutionary science and biology, uh, number one, because I think it's true. And uh, science is, of course, supposed to describe the world as it is, not as we wish it should be. Uh, and if it is true, uh, then it should be more fruitful than banging your head against the wall with uh, theories of unintelligent processes building up uh, complex machinery. Uh, the the um, question, you know, why is this a god? Why is this not a god of the gaps? Well, it, it's interesting. Uh, uh, god of the gaps says, well, wh whenever you don't understand something. Well, then you insert God in there. He, he must have done it. Uh, well, it, it turns out that uh, we're not invoking intelligence or a designer because of ignorance. We're invoking it because of knowledge. Back in Darwin's day, when the cell was thought to be a little blob of jelly, protoplasm, it was a whole lot easier to think that cells could kind of mold themselves into any shape that uh, they needed and grow up to be organisms or eyes or, or whatever. But with the discovery of science, of the complexity of the cell, the fact that DNA carries tons of information, that there are sophisticated machines in the cell, literally machines made out of molecules, uh, then that is... That is what intelligent design is based on. Uh, these are marks of minds. Minds make machines. Minds, uh, ha you know, can convey information. So I think that, in fact, intelligent design is based on our progress in science. And on the flip side, I would say that uh, in my days, I've run across a lot of people who say, yeah, you guys raise good questions, but give us another 30 years, another 40 years, then, then we'll figure it out. And that's, I think, a, a Darwin of the gaps. Uh, they're assuming the answer, not, not uh, based on the evidence we have, but what they, want to, what they want to see become true. So I think also there's a, kind of a, a related question to this is, if you see a, you know, the signature of a intelligent designer in the creation of, of life on Earth, for example, it, how, how do you integrate that with 
um, kind of causal mechanisms. Um, because I, we can certainly say that there are situations, at least within the, in the Christian worldview, where we believe God acted but used uh, natural means of different kinds. So how do, you, how do you kind of fall on this spectrum from kind of a miraculous intervention or providential intervention? Say, you know, a random event occurs that was unlikely, but it's not actually outside of the productive capacity of, of nature as opposed to a, a zap miracle, you know, mm-hmm. flagellum appears. Well, the things that uh, we see in biochemistry, in my own view, are uh, things that could not <laughs> fall under the rubric of providential. When I hear providential, I, I think of, yeah, you know, God knew it was going to happen, but as you say, it's, it's kind of within the purview of, of nature. These aren't in the purview of nature, unless you're going to say, you know, uh, that God set up the universe specifically to allow many, many coincidences to come together at some particular moment. And that I would not call providence. I would call that design because these were intentionally arranged to give rise to uh, molecular uh, machinery. So uh, uh, I am not arguing that God, that there had to be some creative event, some ex nihilo outside of nature, puff of smoke sort of thing. And, and there you have a flagellum. Uh, I'm happy to think that the information was packed into the universe from the beginning and did in fact unfold over time. I'm not saying it did, but I'm saying I have no particular uh, reason to reject that. Certainly not philosophical. Um, But even if that were the case, it would be designed and we can still tell it is designed when we observe the systems themselves, the ones in our modern world, where we see this uh, incredibly precise and functional, purposeful arrangement of parts. That, that's exactly how we detect design. That's exactly how we recognize the work of a mind. Mm-hmm. We, we understand that minds work. You know, we can't read minds, so the only way we can determine intelligence or uh, the degree of intelligence is by the arrangements, the work that the mind has done with physical things that we can perceive with our senses. I think something that um, may be a helpful clarification here is uh, people often will equate evolution with the general idea of just common descent. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the way that you just described intelligent design is completely consistent with some, you know, bacterium sharing an ancestor with something that didn't have a flagellum. But at some point, the parts, you know, almost like a series of dominoes through the generations eventually assembled into a, into a flagellum. Um, so it sounds to me like common descent, common ancestry, and intelligent design are not really that incompatible. No, not at all. Uh, there is nothing in intelligent design per se that says the designer couldn't have designed by using Mm -hmm. descent, you know, so what big deal, you know, who am I going to, I'm not going to be able to tell this designer what to do, you know, Mm -hmm. can uh, do what he wants. I am, I I should say that I am noted among intelligent design proponents as one of the few who says, you know, common descent, you know, it looks persuasive to me. Mm -hmm. I have no uh, problem with it. Uh, But the, I like to use an analogy that um, uh, a while back when my kids would go to McDonald's, would get a, uh, a little transformer type toy with a Happy Meal and you take it out and it looked like a hamburger and you'd <sighs> pull it open and it turns into a, a robot or something. <laughs> and, and that's cool, but the transformation did not happen by accident. It mm, was planned. Okay. It was designed. It was built in. I, I certainly don't know how it could be, but when you're talking about an intelligent designer, especially one who is, uh, the degree of intelligence that we see in life, you know, you certainly can't rule out a priority that, uh, the designer set up life to unfold, mm-hmm. but yet, yeah, you know, everything was prearranged. 
Yeah, you mentioned earlier um, about how in The Edge of Evolution, and I presume as well in Darwin Devolves, you mentioned that the limit of evolution uh, is right around the level of class, I believe. So, Yeah, oh, I changed my mind in, uh, okay. in the most recent book. Uh, yeah, now uh, I think it's, it's much deeper than, and I kind of put it at the level of family. Mm -hmm. and, and class was birds versus fish. And family is cats versus dogs. Mm -hmm. So it's much deeper into biology. So that I, I mean by that, that you could not get a cat and a dog from some generic ancestor mammal. You would have to put information, active information okay. into to specify those families. Okay. So if, if I understand correctly on this hypothesis of the designer, uh, quote unquote, programming life, life could start and then develop with a lot of information infusion at the beginning. And then once you get all the way down to the family level, that's whenever the Darwinian mechanisms are sufficient. The, the, yeah, that yeah, that's, that's pretty much right. You're below the family level. Okay. The, the species and genus are the two levels below family. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sure. It turns out, yeah, people can get confused with the idea of species, but you know, uh, Darwin talked about the origin of species and some people think of species as major classes of organism, but that's the lowest level of biological classification. Mm -hmm. And you can get species that separate or populations of say butterflies, some fly to the left and others fly to the right and they get separated for a while and uh, changes in their DNA prevent them then from coming back and interbreeding you got two species, but you don't have anything really new. It's mm. just they've lost the ability to interbreed with each other. So that's that's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So on this idea of common ancestry and common descent, um, presumably that entails that human beings share a common ancestor with the apes and chimpanzees and whatnot. Um, and while I understand that you are a biochemist, I would I, the, the 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 question is just right there. So where, where do Adam and Eve fit on this picture? Uh, uh, that's an excellent uh, <laughs> question. And the short answer is, I don't know, but a yeah. longer answer is that, uh, I, <clears throat> the difference in biochemistry between people and chimps or w other primates is, is not really well elucidated. No, mm -hmm. you know, scientists don't really know why a monkey, um, cell develops into a monkey and uh, human cells develop into humans, biochemistry is pretty much the same. But nonetheless, with <clears throat> uh, simple observation, we can see that humans are radically different from mm -hmm. other primates, especially in our mental abilities. We can think abstract thoughts. We have minds. We have wills and, and so on. So it's clear that uh, we... Uh, those those uh, extra physical abilities are, in my view, required creation, required mm -hmm. real, you know, uh, ex nihilo yeah, yeah, <laughs> creation, yeah, yeah. the uh, the real thing. Um, so um, where Adam and Eve fit in, I I myself think there was a real physical Adam and Eve, the first parents of the human race. Uh, but the details I'm a little fuzzy on, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and from the science I've read people going back and forth on the topic and I say, bless your hearts, you know, <laughs> let, let me know when you've resolved the issue. And, yeah. And, <laughs> and I mean, honestly, the, you know, our other speakers, uh, tonight, Joshua Swamidas, he, he's written a book uh, on the Adam and Eve mm -hmm. question and how it fits in with, with evolution. And one of the things that was really kind of elucidating in, in his book was just how little information there really is about Adam and Eve in the Bible, mm -hmm. you know, and how much is just assumed to be there. You know, uh, people assume that because, um, you know, people try to make the mitochondrial Eve, the literal Eve of, you know, Genesis two, or they, uh, try to say that whatever the common ancestor was for all humanity, that's the Adam. It's like three chapters. It's only like, I think, 200 words or something. And there's just so much. Oh, and it's in Hebrew, too. It's very <laughs> ancient. It's like there's so much information being just assumed on on that part that, you know, I, I, I kind of share in your your position. Yeah, it looks yeah. like chromosome two. It looks like it fused, but 
Yeah. Man, I don't know what that tells me about Genesis 3 or 2 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Is same here. Uh, yeah. Like, as I said, you know, for theological reasons, one can hold that a mm. real Adam and Eve are um, likely are required. Uh, but the science is real, real fuzzy at this stage. And exactly what it means um, uh, is, you know, is, is still an open question. <laughs> Did you have anything else? <clears throat> All right. Well, um, that is, we thank you so much for your time today. Again, the book is Darwin Duvall's, um, and it is available pretty much wherever books are sold. And uh, we'll actually be doing a giveaway on our Instagram account too. So if you do a like, do a share, then you can be entered for that. Uh, Dr. Behe, thank you so much for uh, being here today. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And that'll be the end. Thanks for listening to this episode. Think Theism is made in association with Russia Christie at Texas A&M University. We invite you to join the weekly Russia Christie meetings every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. The views and opinions that are expressed in all of our episodes are of the speakers only and are not necessarily endorsed by Russia Christie nor by Texas A&M University. For more information, go to thinktheism.org.